as much as I am. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our next keynote speaker, which is Dr. Matthew Desmond. And Matt has become a good friend of mine and a good friend to the movement to end homelessness and housing poverty. He's become a real national leader in that field. And you know, when I talked yesterday about the work that we've all done collectively to elevate the issue of the affordable housing crisis and to raise it as a national dialogue and the success that we've all had in doing that, each and every one of our efforts were helped by Matt's work and by his publication of the book, Evicted. And I know many of you are familiar with that book. It told the stories of individuals who were struggling with eviction, told it really powerfully, and connected it to the systemic change and the systemic challenges that are creating this eviction crisis. The systemic challenges like the severe shortage of homes for the lowest income people, and racial inequities, and lack of resident protections. And it's book really broke through in powerful ways. You've already heard a couple of members of Congress mention this book. Every member of Congress that I've spoken to usually starts the conversation with Matt's book. And it, it's really moved them. They talk about it pretty much every chance they get. They talk about it at congressional hearings. They talk about it with their colleagues and with their constituents. And it's moved them to action. It also won the Pulitzer Prize, so congratulations to Matt for that. And after Matt won the Pulitzer Prize, and after he got the MacArthur Genius Award, he became a professor at Princeton and he founded the Eviction Lab, which is a group of researchers that are working to further um, uncover and expose the eviction crisis. And together they created the first national database of evictions throughout the country. So I want to thank Matt for his good work and thank him for being here today. So please join me in welcoming Matt Desmond to the stage. Utilities have increased by 52% in the 2000s alone. So you have the shrinking gap between what families are bringing in and what they have to pay, right? And then the third ingredient, the one we know also is like the question of where's public housing, where's Section 8, where's any kind of help from the government? The answer is it's there, it's important, it works, and it's only for the lucky minority of poor families today. So the unlucky majority, about 74% of poverty families receive nothing from federal, state, and local governments. And like, I've got two young kids now, and if I apply for public housing today, in this city, for example, chances are I'd be a grandfather by the time my application came up for So that's, that's American option. 
And so this has driven our country to a place where um, rent burden has just been increasing among poor renting families. So this green line is the percent of poor renting families spending 50% or more of their income on housing costs. And the blue line are those that are hitting our standard of affordability, spending 30% or less of their income on housing costs. So there's a spreading gap to the point that today, the majority of poor renting families are spending at least half of their income on housing costs. And about one in four of those families are spending over 70% of their income just on rent and utilities. These numbers come from the American Housing Survey. Let me tell you um, who they leave out. They leave out everyone in that survey that's reporting spending over all of their income on, on housing costs. And some of that is a mistake, some of that's reporting error, but some of that is, is luck, right? And uh, there are a lot of those folks in the AHS. You know, the folks that I've met in Milwaukee, many of them are spending 80, 80% of their income on rent, not to mention utilities. So what you do is you pay your landlord in the winter months when there's more touring or gas shops, right? And then when that moratorium lifts, you kind of switch teams and kind of try to get back in the black with the utility company. And that's why evictions spike in the summer and drop in the winter. So these numbers are scary, and they're hard to believe, and they're probably too conservative. Okay, so that's moved us as a country from a place where eviction used to be rare, a place where eviction used to drop crowds, a place where eviction used to be scandalous, to a place where eviction has become incredibly commonplace, overturning the lives of uh, families and affecting schools and communities in a massive way. And so I started looking into this in 2008. I moved into Milwaukee. I moved into a mobile home park in Milwaukee. Where's my Milwaukee people in here? Yes, okay. Good to see you guys. Keep me honest. Um, and, uh, and spent a lot of time with tenants getting evicted, a lot of time with landlords getting evicted, wrote a book about that. But then there were still all these huge questions that kept springing into mind, like that I just couldn't get to. Like, how many people in America get evicted? <laughs> Is Milwaukee weird? Does it have a really high eviction rate, a normal eviction rate? Which cities have the highest and lowest eviction rates? Who can we learn from? Where is eviction exploding? Which policies work? You know, if we're going to kind of address the eviction crisis, where should we go to learn from these things? And we didn't have answers to these questions. The federal government collects information on foreclosures, chat with homeowners, but not on evictions that happen to renters. So I've spent the last two years with this incredible, amazing team at Princeton and we call ourselves the Eviction Lab, and we've tried to build the first ever national database of evictions. We've hustled for data, we've bought data, we've found data in trailers in West Texas, uh, and we've kind of compiled 83 million eviction records going back to 2000, and we spent the time cleaning them and validating them and mapping them, and putting out a website called the evictionlab.org for everyone. So you don't have to have a PhD in economics from MIT to kind of figure out these data. These data come in a very intuitive form. You can map them, you can look at your city, you can compare them, or you can download the raw data. And so I just kind of want to take some time today to share with you some things we're learning from these data and kind of uh, to spark our conversation. So this is an effort to literally take something that was on the map and, and put it on the map, to render an invisible problem visible again. Okay. This is something that, um, has been an effort from community organizations all over the country. It's been uh, a, a database that has involved so many different actors, and I, if I thank them all today, I would just spend all my time saying thank you. So, thank you, everyone. So, what did we learn? So, in 2016, there were about 2.3 million evictions that were filed in America by our residents. 2.3 million. Just to kind of put that number in context, at the height of the foreclosure crisis, there are about that many foreclosure starts in America. <coughs> so it's like there's a foreclosure crisis level eviction crisis in America uh, every single year. That's kind of the extent of the eviction crisis nationwide. That means about four evictions are filed every minute in this country. Now, as you all know, like not every eviction uh, filed results in eviction. So how many do? So by our estimates, it's about 890,000 of those uh, Filings resulted in eviction, that affects about 2.3 million people. So by our estimates, 2.3 million Americans lived in a home that was ordered to be out, ordered evicted in that year. How big is that number? What is, what is 2.3 million? 2.3 million is like everyone who was arrested for drugs that year doubled. That's what 2.3 million means. We heard a lot about the opioid crisis last year, for good reasons, incredibly um, tragic uh, public health crisis. So about 65,000 Americans died of an overdose that year. So 
2.3 million people put out on the street, which means that for every tragic overdose, there were 36 people rendered homeless through eviction. And these numbers are probably too low. Uh, they, they are absolutely too low. You know, we don't have every formal court order eviction in America. There are big holes in our data, like a California-sized hole, for example. And we're working really hard to kind of fill these things out. And you'll see on the website, you know, when we say, whoa, 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 watch out, you know, the data are too low. And we're working on that, and this is kind of our obsession of ours. So we, we have all that we've got, but we don't have it all. And these also don't count informal evictions. These are evictions that are processed in the shadow of the law, when the landlord pays you to leave, asks you nicely to leave, takes your door off so you leave. And so we don't have those kind of informal evictions either. When I did a survey in Milwaukee to capture informal evictions, I learned that every formal eviction happens, there are about two uh, informal evictions. So we know we're missing a lot. Even so, we're missing a lot. This is a giant, enormous problem. So whose problem is it? Which cities have the highest eviction rates? So if you read the newspaper, you think the housing crisis is in New York City, San Francisco, and Seattle. If you look at eviction rates, you see that the highest cost cities often aren't the highest evicting cities in America. So who are those cities? There are cities like Richmond, Virginia, one in nine renter homes evicted in 2016. Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1 in 13. Albuquerque, New Mexico, 1 in 21. I know this room is having a different conversation, but a lot of folks out there in the public, when they talk about the housing crisis, <coughs> Tulsa and Albuquerque aren't coming to mind. They absolutely should. I think when you look at the eviction data, you arrive at a different kind of uh, level of vision about where the housing crisis is and who's it's affecting than if you just look at rent costs. We're also seeing that eviction isn't just a big city problem. So when I was on book tour for my book, a lot of folks would come up from uh, rural communities and say, I'm seeing this in my community. What do we know? And I'd say, we don't know anything. I, I don't know anything. What do you see? Tell me what you're seeing. And what we're seeing is that small size, mid-sized cities, and rural America is also affected by the eviction crisis. So small city, Wilmington, Delaware, one of 13 renter homes evicted in 2016. Small places in the middle of Wisconsin, Illinois, the populations under 20,000 are also seeing eviction rates that rival those of Richmond, Virginia, some of our highest eviction states. So if you just look at Ohio and Pennsylvania, these are states that are very important in this city for some reason. <laughs> what you see in this purple is population, right? So this is county. So the counties with deep purple are our urban centers, you know, Cleveland, Cincinnati. And yes, there's evictions that are concentrated in our urban cities, What's fascinating to me is there's non-trivial eviction rates in our suburban areas and in our rural areas too. Which means, I think, when we go to our federal legislatures or our Congress people and say, you should care about this issue, we're not saying you should care about an issue that's important to people in Chicago and LA and San Francisco and DC. We're saying you should care about an issue that's important to a lot of Americans. <clears throat> eviction causes loss. You know, families who lose their homes, uh, often lose their school, their kids' school, they often lose their community connection, they often lose their stuff. It takes a good amount of time and money to kind of build a home and eviction can erase that. A formal eviction comes with a blemish or a mark that can affect your credit and it can also affect your access to decent housing. In fact, many of our public housing authorities, even though they don't have to, count eviction as a mark against your application, right? So we're systematically denying housing help to the families that need it the most. That's why you see those families moving into worse neighborhoods and their worst housing after they get evicted. So a lot of landlords are saying no, including the public landlords, and their mark is following them around. We have a study that shows that eviction causes job loss. If any of you in this room have been evicted, you know exactly why that is. It's a consuming, stressful event. It can cause you to make mistakes at work, lose your footing in the labor market, and then there's just the effect that eviction has on your mental health. You know, we have a study that shows that moms who get evicted experience high rates of depression two years later stays with you. We know that between 2005 and 2010, the years where housing costs were soaring across the country, something else was going up to it for suicides and children to do eviction, they doubled during that five-year time. So I think when we all add it up, we care about eviction because it's not just a condition of poverty, it's also a cause of poverty to make things worse. Okay, so the maps I'm showing you today are not maps I created for this talk. These are maps that you yourself can like have access to on our website. We want interactive tools, we have rankings, we, you can kind of overlay your city with 
demographics about poverty, demographics about racial composition of neighborhoods, map of pictures on there, push a button, you have PowerPoint slides, you have customized reports, please use our tool. And if we can make it better, if we can improve it, if you see something on there that we haven't done yet, please reach out to us. We really are engaged every day in conversations with community organizations and legal aid actors and city and state politicians and just trying to kind of uh, bring this issue to the national forefront. We've also kind of paid attention to who's looking at our big guys and why that matters. So since we launched the data set in April, We've generated about 280 news stories, which we feel is very positive. We've had about 175 sessions in the, the website. This is a nerdy academic website. This is an academic lab. Okay? So people, like 300 people, come into our website last time. We feel like it reflects people's interest in this issue. And we've been able to kind of follow where we're having deeper impact. We have a deep impact on kind of this side of the country and shower our impact on that side. That's a data problem. You know, we have worse data on Oregon and California than we do in the Southeast. And it's kind of like allowed us to develop a theory of change about our kind of little role in kind of elevating the housing crisis and informing it. So we see our data is just our role is kind of releasing data, making that data incredibly accessible, and allowing community organizers, tech activists, uh, local journalists to tell their own stories, to kind of use the data and run with it. And that leads often to kind of local action. And so we've been able to see, for example, a story in Richmond, Virginia, that was talking about the New York Times, get pushed deeply by the Virginia media. And just last week, Virginia passed a suite of anti-eviction legislation. From data to storytelling to both of change. So that's what we've kind of looked into. OK, I want to kind of like ask and answer three questions. The first two questions are super preliminary. So this is like hot off the presses. Probably not exactly right. Maybe it is. I don't know. You know, it's it's still it's very new. It's very new. And so um, so just kind of keep that in mind as we go forward. But one question is like, how much are people getting evicted? It's important because you know sometimes when you talk about eviction, you'll hear someone say, well, you know, if my tenant is, is late, like five, six, seven months, what do you want me to do? You know. And so the question is, well, how many tenants are getting evicted are late, like five, six, seven months? You know. Um, and how big is this problem? So this is what we're learning from the data. Millions and millions of eviction records that record arrears of events. And what's striking is that there are some tenants that are late five, six, seven months behind. And by months behind, I just mean the rent in the neighborhood we live in. Uh, that's kind of like you know, how much your arrears amount is related to that. And so there are kind of a small subset of evicted families that do seem to be the families that are like, the landlord is kind of like, you know, uh, forced into eviction or kind of uh, has to take kind of this action, that action. But there are many families that are evicted for very small amounts of money. You know, a third of evictions in America <laughs> take place for, for less than the, the month's rent. So if your rent is 500, you're getting evicted for 400, 300, 200 dollars, something like that. And another third is basically you're about one to two months behind. So about half, over half of our evictions in America are happening for two months rent or less and a third are happening for less than a month's rent. This varies tremendously across states. So we do this blue line in bottom. So we've got Alabama, Delaware, Georgia, kind of states across. And that blue line are these kind of small dollar amount of evictions, evictions for less than a month's rent. And so you'll see like in Delaware, North Carolina, Virginia, non-trivial share of the evictions are for less than a month's rent. In fact, in Virginia, most evictions, 58%, after less than a month <laughs> worth of eviction. So what does that look like in Virginia? That means one out of two evictions in Virginia is for about $940 or less. One out of five is for less than $550. One out of 10 is for less than $335. People are getting evicted for peanuts. It's not everyone, but it's the non-trivial share of the evicted population. What's the policy implications? One is we need to track evictions for public housing. The government doesn't do this. HUD does not do this. We should start doing this. In our data, one thing that we're seeing are the big evictors in many cities are public housing. What do we know about that? You know, I wrote a bit there about the private rental market, and that's where I thought the problem is. The problem is much more diffuse than that. I think we need to start paying attention to that. I think it also means that we can expand emergency assistance and see pretty good returns. If people are evicted for $200, $300, $400, you know, 
that much money could be the thing that stops a uh, family from getting homeless. And this is the kind of the question of emergency assistance, right? If you put a little bit of money in there, how far will it go if you're trying to kind of keep someone in their home? And our data suggests like, you know, it's like the old Washington State, the right policy for the right people could really work. Um, I think we can learn from eviction prevention programs like Homestart and Boston, a huge target uh, evictions in public housing. And then I think that we can think of, if people are not getting evicted for huge sums of money, then can we think of expanding assistance and investment in mediation court or community court uh, in, uh, when it comes to handling evictions? So you guys know this, right? Most of the time we walk into the eviction court, and the judge or the commissioner says, you know, I understand you're behind, by $500, that's true, you say yes, and that's, that's it. You know, the, you know the, it's like, the judge kind of works with the landlord, would you like to work with this person or not, it's kind of the landlord has a say. In a community court, hear me out, the court's kind of like, act like institutions of justice, hear me out. <laughs> and the judge says, are you behind $700? You say yes, and the judge says, why? And they try to deliver services at the point of the eviction, help the landlord get paid, of the tenant kind of address the underlying issue that felt a lot of them fall behind and keep that person in their home. It seems like a win win win. And it can especially be uh, effective for folks that aren't getting evicted for very big sums of money. So that's one thing. Am I doing a time? Come on, right So, um, serial emotions. So, have you guys ever read a report on like evictions and you're like, this cannot be, either the city is going through the apocalypse or this cannot be true? Like this giant eviction thing. So when we first got the data, we were seeing these crazy high rates in some parts of the country. And I was like, I don't believe this. I don't believe this can be true. And so one of my brilliant RAs was looking into this and she discovered this pattern that we call serial evictions. This is how it works. It would be like Diane Mintel is evicted from the same address in January, in March, April, in November, December, the same year. Same person, same address, eviction. In fact, nationwide in our data, every one in two eviction records that we have, the person has been to court before in the same address. This is something we call serial eviction. And in fact, in some states, in South Carolina, one in 25 households threatened with eviction have been threatened with eviction every single month, January, February, March, April, May. And the way that I thought about eviction after the research, and I think a lot of journalists and researchers think about this, is eviction like a discrete event? It's like this thing that happens after like a bad day, like a you know, medical emergency, you lose your job, something like that. But eviction for a lot of people is a routine thing. Like they're getting someone to court over and over and over again. Why, this, why does this matter? Well, first of all, that's just a crummy way to live, right? Like how can you invest in your home, in your neighborhood, kind of be fully present with your kids if you have an eviction and someone's coming every month for you? But it also increases your housing cost per So by our calculations, folks that are serially evicted, they draw them to court, ask to pay court fees and late fees on top of their arrears, that increases their housing cost on average by 22%. That's a giant increase. And so we wanted to look into this a little more. And what we saw is like incredible variation across the country when it comes to serial eviction. So here's two counties, one in South Carolina, one in Alabama. They're pretty similar demographic. You know, they have similar poverty rates, similar rates of composition, similar number of renter households. But you'll see Charleston County, South Carolina, has about a 53% serial eviction rate. For every eviction that happens, there's, it's happened before. You know, 53% serial eviction rate, massive number. Well, if you go across the line to Alabama, it's about a 5% eviction rate. So what's going on? What explains this? Court system explains this. So you go to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, it costs $40 to evict someone. You go to Mobile, it costs about 250 bucks. Right? In South Carolina, the lease is the eviction notice. I don't even know this could happen. You guys know that, but like, if you're a tenant in this county and you fall behind, you don't need to like get an eviction notice and then get a summons. You can just get the summons. It's quicker. You kind of skip a step. But in uh, Mobile, you gotta, you gotta do the, you know, the landlord has to give you notice to eviction. If, you, if those five days pass, then, then the notice uh, goes to summons. So it's kind of a slow <coughs> process. And there's a return requirement for LLCs and other businesses in, in uh, Alabama, now in South Carolina. These kind of ideas, you know, basically, to put it very simply, 
it's cheaper and it's quicker to evict someone in South Carolina than Alabama. And even like above and beyond demographic factors like poverty or racial composition, that really matters for explaining how the court system works and how eviction works. This isn't just kind of a comparison. We've run a bunch of statistical models in the whole country and we show that if you increase the cost of eviction to over $200, you're going to drop the serial eviction filing rate by about 15%. If you require landlords to serve notice, you're going to drop it by about 22%. And if you have an attorney requirement, you're going to drop it by about 30 So it suggests that the stuff, like the devil's in the details and the angels too, you know, it's the stuff that housing law is made of can have a huge impact on the lives of tenants. Civil court regulations really matter. And I think like studying them and analyzing like which ones do should be taken into account. And for a lot of folks in South Carolina and other parts of the country, eviction court is being used as a court of first resort. It's being used as a debt collection service. Eviction should be the court of last resort. It should be the court where landlords and tenants go when they've exhausted all of their efforts. And so I think that we should think of like making eviction court like that. Serial evictions also just put this huge burden on the court. You know, so you go to like, um, you go to like North Carolina, many eviction courts in there, the commissioner has 100 cases an hour. Because they know that most folks aren't gonna show up and it's gonna just cycle through. I think we also should think about late fees. You know, late fees are kind of this hidden kind of burden for many tenants through this kind of serial eviction cost, and we should think about that. And the bigger, more sociological picture is going on, I think, is what's happening is in the low income, low income labor market, it's gotten a lot more squishy. Sociologists like we call it income volatility. Basically like you were 40 hours this week and then they schedule you 20 hours next week, you kind of don't know where your schedule is going to be. Your income really fluctuates up and down. But the housing market has got a lot, it's got more inflexible, more property management, more professionalization, kind of more algorithms to like monitor rent payment. So it's kind of like this kind of, um, your, your pay has kind of gotten a lot more flexible, and your rent payments have gotten a lot more inflexible. And so what should we do about that? One thing that we can ask is like, why does rent have to be due on the first? Like, why is that like a thing? You know, so if we have payments, if I'm a bartender, you know, and I get half my paycheck, you know, in two weeks, and the other half in the other two weeks, why should I have to pay like $150 late fee because my rent is coming to me? So I think that rents can kind of think about how to like link up with the inflexibility of the low wage labor market. Another thing we did with this, um, this study is we talked to landlords and property managers in South Carolina and Alabama. We just wanted to figure out like, uh, what's going on? Like, uh, can you kind of tell us like how you think about serial emissions? And one thing that we heard, which is kind of surprising to us, is the Fair Housing Act might actually be contributing to this. And so um, uh, property manager in South Carolina told us, quote, we're concerned that if we don't file eviction on the if we don't file, it will set a legal precedent that says we committed a tardy payment. And we're very concerned by fair housing laws and civil rights laws that we not treat customers different from one So in other words, if you know Paul can make the payment anyways, you have a good relationship with Paul, you know he's good for it, but you don't want to be accused of playing favorites to someone like Paul. You just serve them anyway, and you make them get away. It's interesting. You know, the Fair Housing Act was intended to limit landlord agency, and maybe it's doing it on the back end, the eviction process, in a way that we haven't fully really anticipated. So this is a thing that's not preliminary. This is a study that I just released uh, last month. Um, and it asks this question, because you guys know this. You know, there are a lot of policy discussions, and then someone will say, well, wait a minute. Don't landlords need to make a return? You know, um, if you do this, if you, if you uh, increase just cause eviction laws, if you make me abate that lead uh, payment, their payment, um, isn't that going to drive up landlord's costs and everything to pass along to tenants? It's a really important question. And in Milwaukee, I was kind of fascinated with this question. And I crunched the numbers of the landlord that I was working from, the landlord that I was spending time with. Um, but I just didn't know if they were representative. You know, how much are uh, folks making across the country? And so, I want to show you some data about what we've learned here. This is data from Milwaukee. And what it kind of shows is this kind of median regression models. And on the kind of bottom axis, you're going to see family poverty rates. So, as the line goes this way, the neighborhoods get about poor. 
And on this kind of access, you kind of see monthly rent over property value. So one way to kind of measure overpayment